So I don't know if it's uh, gender related, but our son never did this. We've got four daughters, all four daughters consistently, same thing. They have movies they watch as kids, and they are so into the movies that they can quote the movie line by line, song by song. Now, I should not alert any professors of one of my daughters to this fact, but it's true that if you take any of my daughters and you sit them down in a room, they can do the entire Goofy movie. <laughs> they can do it from beginning to end. They can sing every song. They can do the motions. Rebecca, you want to come up on stage and do some of the Goofy movie? No, I didn't think you did, but you could, couldn't you? Yes, she could. She actually acts it out. I don't know if you've noticed how many people grow up holding on to the stories they learned in childhood. My mom, we were in Lubbock last week, and mom uh, was quoting the poem, Little Boy Blue, Come Blow Your Horn. No, it wasn't that. It was something, something, tattered, and t what was the poem, mom? No, shout it out. Be loud, be proud. What was it? Shout it out for her. Her voice is gone. The little toy? Yes, that one. <laughs> and mom, who is only 39, memorized that song over, or that poem as a child over 50 years ago and can still say it. And she's only 39, and I'm sticking with it. Now, the, the thing is, it's amazing how these stories work. And our minds in that regard aren't really that different than the minds of someone like the Apostle Paul. In fact, I'll go a step further and say that at the time of Paul, their minds were even better oriented to memorization than ours are today. A Jewish scholar like Rabbi Paul would have memorized likely the whole Old Testament, certainly the first five books, the Torah. So you've got someone who's a remarkable scholar with a remarkable memory that we will be continuing to discuss today as we finally, God willing, finish the book of Acts in this New Testament survey. I suspect for Paul... And for any good Jewish boy or girl, one of the best stories of the Old Testament, which would be their stories that they learned, figuring they didn't have the goofy movie and other things to occupy their mind, one of the stories would have had to have been Noah. And I was reminded of Noah both because Bill Cosby has a new TV show coming out, and I loved Bill Cosby's Noah monologue when I was a kid. Um, uh, you remember, how long can you tread water, if you remember that monologue. But I also was fresh on this because of a Mr. Boffo comic strip that appeared recently, where it gave sort of the backstory behind Noah and all of those animals. I pulled it for you. Here's Noah explaining to a neighbor. So then he says, the choice is up to me. Either take my mother-in-law or two of every animal on the planet. Clearly, Noah did not have my mother-in-law or my wife's mother-in-law or the animals would have been wiped out. But uh, 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 I know that, that for Paul, there had to be some recognition, not only of the story of Noah, but the other story of seafarers in the Old Testament, Jonah, Jonah and the whale. So I find it interesting for Paul or for any Jew to be a seafarer. The nation of Israel, the kingdom of Judah, was not a seafaring nation. Don't get me wrong, they fished the Sea of Galilee up north, but Israel didn't really have a port. And for Israel, and in the Hebrew language, inherent with water, is the idea of chaos. It was a dangerous place. Let the Phoenicians and others go chart the, the waters. Jews did not like to. 
So it's interesting to me to look at today's lesson with that type of a mindset that Paul must have grown up with, even though he was such a well-traveled soul by the time we get to this lesson today, that he no doubt had overcome much of the prejudice toward the water. So with that in mind, let's pick up where we have been. Paul has made it back to Jerusalem. Paul was arrested wrongfully. The Jews tried to ambush and kill Paul while he was in Roman custody in Jerusalem. So Paul was spirited out in the night by the Roman soldiers and taken to Caesarea, which is a coastal town, half Jewish, half Roman. It was a town where there was not only the, the governor sitting of the province, but it was a town where the governor was really dealing with the unrest between Jew and and Gentile. We're just, a, let's see, this is 59 AD. 68 AD, nine years later, the Jewish revolt against Rome will begin. And it began in Caesarea and spread from there to Jerusalem. So this is an area of discontent. This is an area where Paul has been offered a chance to go back and, and have his trial in Jerusalem, but Paul instead says, no, I'm appealing to Caesar, which was Paul's right as a Roman citizen. Apollo ad Caesarae, I appeal to Caesar. And so Paul's appeal is put into place, and after spending two years in Caesarea under house arrest, Paul is sent under the care of an Italian centurion who would be the chief over a century of soldiers or over a hundred soldiers, Paul is sent to Rome. That's the story we're going to follow. Now, as we follow the story, we're going to look at the text in a little bit of detail. We're running a little behind, so we may not do it as much. But I really, really would like you to see the historicity of what's being written here. Because we have a tendency when we read the Bible to read it uh, as divine but almost to compartmentalize it from the rest of our life which deals with real things and history. And yet in the midst of the divinity of Scripture is also reliable and accurate history of real people living real lives, undergoing real adventures and experiences. And I think perhaps the most compelling evidence of that is Acts chapter 27. And I think it's compelling because Luke easily, when he wrote Acts, he can dismiss two years in a verse. But in Acts chapter 27, he goes into excruciating detail for some reason. If he had read Strunk and White's Essential Elements of Style, he'd have known rule one is omit needless words. These aren't needless words. These words meet a purpose for him. So let's go to the Elmo, and this is the ultimate test for the people up in the sound booth. Ladies and gentlemen up there, you're going to earn your pay, which is zero, but we are going to be doubling it. <laughs> ah, triple it. Um, because we are going to alternate between the Elmo and the PowerPoint with some rapidity. We think we might ought to focus. There we go. So here it is. When it was decided that we should sail for Italy. Now, we pause to notice the we there. Luke is part of Paul's contingency here. It's another reason this histor historical writing is so significant. This is not simply Dr. Luke writing hearsay. He's writing a first-hand account that he experienced. And you'll see that by the incredible detail that he inserts. When it was decided we should sail for Italy, they delivered Paul and some other prisoners to a centurion of the Augustan cohort named Julius. I know what you're thinking. Was he orange? We don't know. And embarking in a ship 
of Adramidium. Now, we've got some young people who come to this class who I'm sure are thinking that that's one of the elements in the X-Men that is used for the claws. No, a ship of Adramidium is not a reference to what it's made of. It's a reference to where it sails from, its port of call. If we could go back to the Elmo for just a moment, I mean to the PowerPoint for just a moment. We can look on the map and throw some of these places up here. So uh, Adramidium is up on the northwestern Turkish coast between Ephesus and what we today would call Istanbul. And so that's where the boat hailed from that was being caught down in Caesarea. So with that, we go back to the, El uh, to the Elmo, please. This boat was about to sail to the ports along the coast of Asia. Now those ports, if we go back to the PowerPoint, <laughs> hey, they're doing good. Those are the ports that are up here. We call it Asia Minor today, but they weren't cognizant of the Far East. So what we today call the Middle East for them was simply Asia. So this is the coast right in through that area. They're going to put in at Sidon. Let's go back to the text and we'll look at that for a moment. We put to sea, accompanied by Aristarchus, a Macedonian from Thessalonica. The next day we put in at Sidon. That's the point I showed you on the map. It was just a one-day sail. Julius treated Paul kindly and gave him leave to go to his friends and be cared for. Now, be cared for is the Greek word epimeleia. And, it, and it, it's a medical term, which Luke the doctor is using, that's only used one other time in Scripture. Luke uses it in the story of the Good Samaritan to talk about how uh, the Samaritan uh, took care of the man who'd been beat up. He got him to the inn. He paid the innkeeper and told the innkeeper to take care of him. It means to bind up wounds or to, to nurse in health. It means to, to give aid to in a physical way. This tells us that Paul is not in the best of health. And so Paul is being allowed to get some medical treatment from the Christians at Sidon. So from there, we put out to sea and we sailed under the lee of Cyprus. Now, how many of you sail? Oh, come on. We're in a port city. Just pretend you sail. How many of you say, like, how many of you read or watch Popeye? Oh, yeah, so you're there. Lee, that means if the wind is blowing from here into the projector, the lee side is the side opposite the winds blow, okay? If, if you put it into shade and sun, if, if the wind is like the sunbeams, the lee side would be the shade side, okay? So we sailed under the lee of Cyprus, because the winds were against us. And when we had sailed across the open sea along the coast of Cilicia and Pamphylia, we came to Myra in Lycia. Now, why on earth is he putting in these names? I'm telling you, Luke was a lawyer wannabe. He at least was a lawyer's dream. Because Luke consistently gives these references. He gives names, Julius the centurion. He gives all of these points of reference for you to go check his sites, as we would say. Check his sources. So if we go back to the PowerPoint for a moment, we'll throw these places up there. So they put in at Sidon. They sailed across the Lee of Cyprus and got to Cilicia and Pamphylia. They're working the coast of Asia, getting their way up to Adramidium. Now, if we continue, they get to the port of Myra, right there on Turkey. And, whoops, at the point of Myra, they change ships. Because ultimately, they're going to Italy. They're not going to Adramidium. They just got the first ship going out to Adramidium. So at Myra, they have to change ships. If we go back to the Elmo, we'll see it. Luke recorded there at Myra, the centurion found a ship of Alexandria that was sailing for Italy, and he put us on board. We sailed slowly for a number of days and arrived with difficulty off Snidus. 
And as the wind did not allow us to go farther, we sailed under the lee of Crete off Salmon. Actually, it's Salmone. Coasting along it with difficulty, we came to a place called Fair Havens. Sounds like a subdivision to me. But if you're reading it in Greek, it's Kalos Lemenos, which means a beautiful harbor. So they came to a, a beautiful a, a, a harbor, a safe harbor, near the city of Lycia. Let's go back to the PowerPoint for a moment. Here's what they do. So from Myra, they go to Snidus, and you can tell that they were going to try and skirt across Greece and go up Greece and cross to the Italy of Boot and uh, to the Boot of Italy, and they can put in. But the winds are against them. So instead, they start going south to the lee side of the island of Crete. And as they go south, they go past Salmone, and they come around to a harbor called Fair Haven, or Beautiful Harbor, depending on who's translating it, me or them. Um, that's where they wind up. It's at this point that we have some nautical information. If we go back, we see, since much time had passed, the voyage was now dangerous because even the fast was over. Uh, lesson here. Go back to the PowerPoint. Uh, pull up Crete. Let's look a little bit more carefully. They've come to Salmone and sailed past it and come across to Fair Haven. Now the debate they've got at the beautiful harbor is should they stay there, which while beautiful perhaps, it's not the best harbor for the ship. Or should they try and sail to a better harbor at a place called Phoenix? Phoenix used to be a harbor town. Phoenix. That's a voyage of about 55 miles, though it would take a little bit longer because you draw those straight lines on these sailings, but they zig and they zag to make the sail work. So it takes a lot longer. It's not a straight shot. And furthermore, you never, back then, the GPS wasn't brilliant. And so you didn't just sail straight. You always kept the, the shore as much as possible uh, uh, near you so that you could uh, chart yourself and skirt the shore. So this is what they do. This is the debate. Paul says, nah, we shouldn't be doing this. If we go back to the text, Paul advised them. Now this is not Paul speaking the word of the Lord. Paul didn't have a prophetic gift. This is Paul, just smart guy, well-traveled. Maybe, being Jewish, maybe in their minds, yeah, they're all afraid of the water. But Paul says, uh, Sirs, I perceive the voyage will be with injury and much loss. Not only of the cargo and the ship, but also our lives. Now that's very politely stated. Here's what Paul says. Hey guys, while you're making this decision, I just want to tell you. I think this is really dangerous. I think we're going to lose a bunch of cargo. I think your ship's going to get ripped up. I think a bunch of people are going to die. And I think we ought to stay the winter here. The centurion paid more attention to the pilot and to the owner of the ship than to what Paul said. And because the harbor was not suitable to spend the winter in, the majority decided to put out to sea from there, whoops, on the chance that somehow they could reach Phoenix, a harbor of Crete that faced both southwest and northwest, and they could spend the winter there. So if we go back, we need to understand a little bit of what's going on here. And because this is such a wonderful era of human history, we have great writings outside of the Bible that educate us about the shipping in the Mediterranean world. So we'll pull up the chalkboard and we'll talk about what we know. 
We know from outside biblical sources that it was considered to be safe in the Mediterranean traveling by ship between May 27th and September 14th. That's the safe season. If you wanted to go during the risky season, there were two of those on both sides of the safe period. On the early side, you could travel as early as March the 10th. Or you could travel as late as November the 11th. But those several months between March and May, between September and November, were considered very risky for travel. Then the Mediterranean was shut down absent some emergency. No one traveled the Mediterranean during the winter months. Between November 11th and March 10th, the weather was too severe. Now Luke tells us the fast had already passed. The fast is a reference to Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. So the Day of Atonement, we can date this pretty well because of who the governors were that Luke's identified. So we're staring pretty much firm in the face 59 AD. We're able to go back and recalculate. We know that Yom Kippur in 59 AD would have been October 5th. So that has already passed, which tells us if we're reading it with the mentality of Luke's readers, that we're in the risky travel time. As we continue to read what happens, a little bit more data will unfold in a bit that will tell us we're at the end of the risky period. We're probably in November. So the decision is made, if they're, if they're in this risky time, the decision is made to go ahead and try to get to Phoenix. Let's go back to our map, or to the text, thank you. So there was a south wind that started blowing, gently. And they supposed they had obtained their purpose, they weighed anchor, they sailed along creek close to the shore. But soon a tempestuous wind called the Northeaster struck down from the land. Tempestuous. It's a great Greek word. It's the Greek word typhonikos. What do we get from typhonikos? Any ideas? Typhoon. A typhoon comes down from the northeast. And when the ship was caught and could not face the wind, we gave way to it and were driven along, running under the lee of a small island called Cauda. We managed with difficulty to secure the ship's boat. After hoisting it up, they used supports to undergird the ship. Now you're thinking, well, what did they secure the ship's boat? Yes, they have lifeboats that they would pull along behind the ship. But when the waves are getting really tough and you don't have control of the lifeboat, the lifeboat itself can smash into the ship or it can capsize. So they pull the lifeboat to the ship, they secure it, and then they secured the ship too. What they would do back then is they would take ropes and pass them under the ship, both around it widthwise and fasten it lengthwise. They're basically tying the ship together so it doesn't break apart. This is not a good time. Then fearing they'd run aground on the Sirtis, Sirtis is a sandbar, they lowered the gear and they were thus driven along. Since we were violently storm-tossed, they began the next day to jettison the cargo. I wonder if Paul said, told you. <laughs> On the third day, they threw the ship's tackle overboard with their own hands. When neither sun nor stars appeared for many days, and no small tempest lay on us, all hope of our being saved was at last abandoned. Since they'd been without food for a long time, Paul stood up among them. <laughs> now, why are they without food? <laughs> yeah, you're not eating much either. Paul stood up among them and said, Hey guys, you should have listened to me and not have set sail from Crete and incurred this injury and loss. And while Paul had spoken as Paul before, now Paul's got a word from the Lord. Yet now I urge you to take heart. 
There will be no loss of life among you, but only of the ship. For this very night there stood before me an angel of the God to whom I belong, whom I worship. And he said, don't be afraid, Paul. You must stand before Caesar. And behold, God has granted you all those who sail with you. So take heart, men, for I have faith in God. It will be exactly as I've been told. But we are going to run aground on some island. And when the 14th night come, came, they did. Now, if we go back to the PowerPoint, let me get us caught up with the PowerPoint. So here's where they are. The south wind starts to blow. They need to go from Fairhaven up to Phoenix. They're thinking, hey, just what we needed, a gentle south wind. And so they commence to going. While they're skirting the shore of Crete, all of a sudden, the south wind is gone. And the northeaster comes in. So the northeaster blows them down to the lee side of Cauda. And while that's a small island, while they had the benefit of that island blocking at least some of the wind, they took the lifeboat and pulled it on. They strapped ropes around the hull of the ship. And then they tried to drop anchors. They tried to do everything they could, but it just didn't work. Basically, here's what happened. Just sit right back and you hear a tale, a tale of a fateful trip That started from this tropic port aboard this tiny ship The mate was a mighty sailing man, skipper brave and sure Five passengers set sail that day for a three-hour tour A three-hour tour The weather started getting rough, the tiny ship was tossed if not for the courage of the fearless crew, the middle would be lost. The middle would be lost. The ship set ground on the shore of this uncharted desert isle with Gilligan. Okay, you didn't really two, have Gilligan. A millionaire. I don't know about the millionaire and the rest of them. A movie star, the professor and Mary Ann. Here on Gilligan's Isle. So, the here on Gilligan's Isle. So the, only those who are my age or older will appreciate that song. See, Rebecca, those of us who didn't grow up with a goofy movie, watched Gilligan's Island. So we still know those songs. So they make it to the island of Malta, though they don't know what it is at the time. They've made it through this. Uh, here they go. Island of Malta. It's that little bitty dot off of si Sicily from the boot of Italy. And they don't just get to Malta. It happens pretty much like Paul says. It's at the 14th night, about midnight. Well, let's... No, nah, we're running late on time. So here's what happens. About midnight, the, the sailors realize they're getting close to ground and, and close to an island, so they start dropping to get their depth. They realize the depth's getting shallower and shallower. Some of the sailors say, uh, we need to go check things out. So they put the lifeboat back down. Paul realizes they're just leaving. They figure they're close enough to land. The sailors are getting off the ship because they know that it's not a port they're familiar with. And they don't want to be on the ship when it busts up on the shoals. Paul says to the centurion, hey, just want you to know, they're getting off, and if they get off, none of us are getting out of this alive. At which point the centurion says, thank you sailors very much for the offer, but no, and cuts the rope and lets the lifeboat go. We sink or swim together. The ship runs aground on a sandbar and gets lodged or on a reef, and the ship starts breaking apart. One of the soldiers says, hey, we've got some prisoners. They'll escape if we all just jump ship. So why don't I kill the prisoners and then the rest of us can swim for our lives? The centurion likes Paul. Says, no, nah, we're not going to do that. I like Paul. Just says to Paul, hey, promise you won't run away. Paul says, I promise. And so everybody grabs a plank. They jump overboard and they get washed up on this island. It's the island of Malta. Now, Luke says that this is an island of barbarians, if you look at the King James translation. The English Standard Version just calls them natives of the island. The Greek word is, in fact, barbarnoi, which is, or barbaroi, which means we get barbarians from it. But it doesn't mean that they're savages. 
For the Greeks, if they met people who didn't speak Greek or Latin, they called them barbarians because to them, to the Greek ear, their language sounded like bar, 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 bar. So they just called them the barbars. That's where we get the word barbarian from. The barbars. Bar, 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 bar. Well, the barbars are actually Phoenicians, so they would have spoken a Semitic language like Paul. Paul is able to converse with them pretty well. And it's really interesting what happens there on Malta. The, the natives are very nice. They feed Paul. We don't know exactly what they fed him. I'm assuming it's Malta meal, malted milk, and some malted milk balls. But I don't know for certain. I'm going out on a limb there. That's not in the text. But they go, they get fed by the, by the, the, the people from Malta. And from there, they spend the winter interesting story happens. I love this story. We got to look at this story. Paul throws this in there for a reason. Um, uh, da, 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 da. Yeah, yeah, here we are. We're now into chapter 28. How are we doing? We got 11 minutes. We're doing good. Y'all don't go to sleep on me. So here's what happens. Ah, there we go. After we were brought safely through, we learned the island was called Malta. The barbars showed us unusual kindness, for they hand, kindled a fire and they welcomed us all because it had begun to rain and was cold. It's winter time, okay? When Paul had gathered a bundle of sticks, listen to that. Paul is out there helping. He's out there working. He's doing his part. When Paul had gathered a bundle of sticks and put them on the fire, a snake comes out of the heat and it grabs hold of Paul's hand and bites him. Now the native people see the creature hanging from his hand and they said to one another, hey, this guy's got to be a murderer. He escaped from the sea, but justice has not allowed him to live. Justice tried to kill him in the sea. But now justice latched hold of his hand, sunk its fangs into him, falls a goner. Paul just shakes off the creature into the fire, suffers no harm. They're waiting for him to swell up. Fall down dead. But when they'd waited a long time and saw he was just dandy, they changed their minds. Said, he ain't a murderer. He's a god. I love this story because we're at the end of Acts. And Luke is this fellow who's been constantly writing in chiasms where he, he matches the back to the front. And as he's drawing an end here, he's matching it to the start of Genesis, but with a twist. You remember the serpent appears in Genesis, in the garden. And there the serpent says, hey, do what I say and you'll be like a god. You eat of the tree and you'll be like God, knowing the difference between good and evil. And the serpent deceives Adam and Eve. And Adam and Eve and eat, but they don't become like gods. Now we get to the end and the serpent latches a hold of Paul. But Paul has absolutely no use. Paul who is armed with the gospel. Paul who has Jesus Christ as his salvation. Paul just shakes the snake off into the fire where scripture says that serpent will spend eternity. And it's a beautiful picture that Luke adds for us. And if we just read this stuff through and don't realize, he hasn't put needless words in there. He's put words with a point. It's a marvelous point. So with that, um, uh, oh, the chief is there. He's hospitable. He's got sick family. His sick family has got diseases. And uh, uh, if we look at it, Paul visits the sick. He prays, puts hands on him, and heals him. This is Publius he healed, the father of Publius, I'm sorry. And when this had taken place, all the rest of the people who had diseases also came and were cured. They also honored us greatly. When we were about to sail, they put on board whatever we needed. What a blessing for Paul. And after three months, and this is why we know it was close to November, because they can't start traveling again. Three months that had winter, we had wintered in the island, a ship of Alexandria with the twin gods as a figurehead. Castor and Pollux were two Greek mythological gods 
that were the patron saints of sailors. So this is some pagan ship, but they were all a bunch of pagans by and large, so it's no big deal to Luke. But anyway, they've got gods as a figurehead as opposed to Paul who has a real God that heals. They put in at Syracuse. We stayed there three days. From there, we made a circuit, arrived at Regium. After one day, a south wind sprang up. We went to Petioli. Can you tell they're getting into Italy? I mean, Petioli. There we found brothers and were invited to stay with them for seven days. And so we came to Rome. And the brothers there from Rome, when they heard about us, came as far as the Forum of Appius and three taverns to meet us. On seeing them, Paul thanked God and took courage. When we came into Rome, Paul was allowed to stay by himself with the soldier that guarded him. And Paul gets to Rome and begins to preach Jesus. Now, if we go back to the PowerPoint for a moment, we'll get the journey done here. So from Malta, they winter over. They go to Syracuse for a couple of days. They hit Regium. They go up north to Pudioli. From there, they put in. That was a big port city for Italy. The Appian Road, which was the highway into Rome, is just a few kilometers away from there. So they go, they get on the Appian Road and take it into Rome. Interesting, the Roman church sends out greeters for Paul who come, Luke gives the name, but those locations, the furthest one was about 33 miles from Rome. So the church got 33 miles on the road to Paul to greet him. Paul had never been to this church before. He'd written the church and said, I long to come to you. That was about three or four years earlier. But Paul was getting to go to the church and the church was so excited to see him. And it's such a marvelous story that we have of Paul going from Caesarea to Rome. While Paul's in prison at Rome, he writes back to some of his other churches. He writes to the church at Philippi and says the following, I want you to know, brothers, that what's happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. So it's become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. And most of the brothers, having become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Seeing how God has worked through all of these circumstances to get me to Rome where I'm preaching to the very imperial courts themselves. It's an amazing thing that God did in the midst of what was a day-to-day -day adventure and fight for survival. Which brings us to our points for home. Soon a tempestuous wind, a typhoon called the Northeaster, struck down from the land. Now I'm always cautious about taking scripture and building an allegory on it. Because that's dangerous. <laughs> but I think this is a safe allegory. Because it's a scriptural allegory. And here it is. Storms of life come and go. They come in seasons, perhaps. They come when you're ready for them. They come when you're not ready for them. The storms come and entirely blow you off course. The storms come and, 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 and when they strike, they can, can put fear in everyone. And they drive us to our knees, hopefully in prayer and in concern. But the assurance, the biblical assurance, the assurance from the life of Paul, the assurance from the life of Christ, the assurance from the life of Noah, the assurance from the life of Jonah, the assurance from everything within Scripture is that there is a God who is over the storms, whether it's the storms of the sea or the storms of life, who will not let you or I go. And in that, I take solace. I take confidence. I read these stories. I realize that Paul is engaged. He's giving counsel. He's trying to figure out what... He sees where there are mistakes. He's trying to fix them. He's saying to the captain, don't let them go or we're all going to die. 
He's doing the best he can, but he's doing it confident that there is a God above him. As he acknowledges the Lord in all of his ways, he's confident God will direct his paths. And that's my point for home for me. I need to trust God in life's storms. Point for home too. I love this line. Hey, no doubt, no doubt this man's a murderer. Not, I think he's a murderer. Hey, he might be a murderer. Hey, no doubt, no doubt he's a murderer. Holy smoke, he's a god. <laughs> murderer, god. Ah. I, isn't that just hilarious? We think, oh, those barbars, that's just the way they were. Until we read Matthew 16 where Jesus says to Peter, who do you say that I am? And Peter says, oh, you're Jesus, the son of God. Blessed are you, Simon. You didn't get this on your own. The Lord revealed this to you. And then just a few verses later, Jesus says, I'm going to go to Jerusalem. I'm going to be sacrificed. I'm going to die for the sins of the people. Peter, no, no, don't do that. Jesus, get behind me, Satan. You don't think like God does. You think like, I mean, even Peter goes from hearing the voice of God confirming Jesus as the Savior of the world and the Son of God to listening to the voice of Satan and dealing with self-interest. We do that all the time. And, you know, this is, this is part two of the Garden of Eden. Part one, the serpent said, you'll be like God. Our goal is not to be like God. Paul wasn't a God. Our goal is to worship God. And uh, to quote that great philosopher who wrote for the who, we won't be fooled again. Um, we have a place before God, and God has a place before us. And let's not keep, let's quit trying to switch those, okay? Last point for home. The brothers there, when they heard about us in Rome, came as far as the Forum of Appius and three taverns to meet us. I love this. Reminds me of the psalm that says, Behold how good and pleasant it is when brothers and sisters dwell in unity. It's like precious oil upon the head running down on the beard of Aaron upon the collar of his robes, like the dews of Hermon that fall from the mountains of Zion. For there the Lord, there in fellowship, the Lord has commanded the blessing of life forevermore. What a fellowship. And I think about what uh, uh, the, the tailors are doing, basically saying, if you're alone or if you've got a difficulty with Thanksgiving, come to our house for Thanksgiving and don't spend it alone. That's a fellowship. And it's an honor to be a part of yours. And I thank you for being a part with me. Would you pray with me? Father, we're very thankful to you for today, for the blessings that today brings, whether in the midst of fair weather or in the midst of storms. We pray that your encouragement, that your courage, that your faithfulness, that your strength, that your compassion and your love will be evident to us as we seek to live today. Lord, may our compass and our voyage of life be oriented to you. And may no storm or anything do anything other than drive us closer to you and to your heart till we join you in home eternally. We pray this through Jesus our Lord. Amen.